introduce my friend, uh, colleague, coworker, uh, Monica Villalpando. So a little background um, on Monica. So she is the founder and the CEO of Via Innovations, a bespoke cannabis product development company that specializes in fit-for-purpose formulation technology and creative design. Prior to joining the cannabis industry in 2016, her academic research and pharmaceutical background focused on enabling technologies to improve the efficacy of poorly water-soluble compounds in the U.S. and in Europe. Her experience also encompassed over 10 years of inhalation drug development involving dry powder inhalation, nebulizers, and vape products in the pharmaceutical, nicotine, and cannabis industries. In 2014, she was directly involved in the implementation of e-cigarette safety and regulatory standards for tobacco products directive in the United Kingdom. There, she collaborated with the University of Manchester to evaluate emissions from vape products and was active in the all-party parliamentary group discussion discussions and education. Monica integrates her scientific background into her other role as a yoga teacher, where she focuses on anatomy and breathing techniques to enhance athletic performance. As an 18-year dedicated yoga practitioner and lifelong um, athlete, she unites this diverse background into her yoga classes and approach to creating differentiated products by harmonizing nature, technology, and mindfulness with Via Innovations. So um, very happy to welcome Monica. Also for full disclosure, I actually work with Monica at uh, Via Innovations as well. So this is very fun for me to host her on Can Journal Club where we can talk about it. So um, Monica, great to have you. And, and I'd like to just start with some questions about, um, so, so the audience can get to know you um, a little bit. So th there's a fun story that uh, we can share. Uh, Monica, do you wanna share the, the story with the audience about uh, how we met through Can? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Highly recommend Can. Thank you for the invite again. I always love being on the well virtual stage now more recently, and I like that this is uh, live too. It makes it feel a bit more interactive. Uh, but yeah, Nigam, you and I we first met uh, through Can while we were uh, working on chairing an event for ACS in San Diego a few years back, and the topic was cannabis and water merging the insoluble. And you called me up and said, hey, do you want to join forces? I'm Nigam. I'd never met you before. I think you were still in Massachusetts back then. And we ended up chatting for over an hour and just talking science, talking cannabis. And, and then you told me you were moving to San Francisco. We, we hung out. We became friends. Um, in parallel to that, V Innovations was growing and expanding. And I'm um, always looking for quality scientists and people I enjoy working with. And so it was the right place at the right time. And so you're the, you're the guy that keeps all the, what do we say, the wheels greased in the company. <laughs> so. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. We have a lot of fun at VA Innovations, and it can. So um, having a lot of fun keep doing cannabis science all around. Speaking of which, so um, Monica, you shared a little bit about uh, how we met through uh, the water soluble session at CAN. And a lot of folks familiar with VIA Innovations know uh, that that is in your realm of expertise. But what everyone may not know or, or may have not known until we shared your bio here, that you actually have significant experience um, in vaporization uh, technologies and have worked with regulatory bodies uh, in Europe uh, after your time in academia and in pharma. So can you share a little bit about your inhalation experience and your international experience? Yeah, of course. Uh, well, I my pharmaceutics background started in inhalation drug product development. After my bachelor's in biology, I worked for a company called Nectar Therapeutics, and we were uh, focusing on dry powder uh, in, inhalers and, and various compounds thereof, uh, combating COPD, cystic fibrosis. I was there for four years and then uh, transitioned into my PhD work that focused on the water solubilization technologies. And then after my, uh, I did my PhD in Belgium. And so after I completed my PhD, I, I took a job on it, uh, Johnson & Johnson, their, their research and development site in Belgium. Uh, 
continued on the inhalation um, product development in addition to uh, oral dis um, formulations for poorly water soluble drugs. Um, but then it was the shift and sort of the transition into cannabis came into play when I moved to the United Kingdom for personal reasons and I couldn't find a pharmaceutics job. And there was not much around near Manchester and money was getting tight. So I was like, okay, let's see what else is out there. And the tobacco products ha directive had just come out. Um, that was around 2014 for the regulation of e-cigarettes um, at that time, very destructive technology. So given my inhalation background that I had in pharma, I saw a direct um, need here for safety <laughs> considerations and and regulatory environment to an unregulated environment and uh, position myself out of the lab and more on the education standpoint and, and being around entrepreneurs and, and, and yeah, these challenging um, stigma and, and all of these other considerations thereof uh, were really the bridge uh, that helped support and bolster my transition into the cannabis industry. And, and as I was making that way into transition um, in California, when I finally did move into uh, the cannabis industry, I used that background um, on the inhalation because I saw so many synergies, not only um, the fact that vape products were uh, second to combustion, the most common route of administration, but also where the industry was going, where it was headed, um, some of the testing requirements that are, are um, now getting implemented, or I highly recommend it will be implemented very soon, um, that we already faced with uh, in the nicotine space. So I saw a great bridge and a transition there. Well, excellent. Thank you for sharing. So one uh, other thing that, that leads us well into your presentation that some folks may um, not have known in, until seeing this uh, presentation or, or reading your bio is that you have so much uh, experience in, in yoga. It's kind of funny. I, I like to say that some people, you don't call them until they've had their morning coffee. So we all know not to call Monica until she's had her morning yoga. So um, I don't know if you want to share a little more about that or if you just want to take us into your presentation. Um, yeah, no, absolutely. Well, definitely. Let's talk, talk about the yoga practice. It'll come through, um, with the presentation. So I'll, I'll leave that for, for the talk coming up, but yeah, it's been a very integral part of, of my life. Awesome. All right. Well, um, Monica, can you go ahead and, uh, share your screen with us and, absolutely. um, okay, great. All right. Okay, well, yeah, thank you again so much for having me. I was really looking forward to this talk because it's uh, different from what I normally talk about, which is the formulation of poorly water soluble compounds. Um, so just to kind of hone in on, on what we, on the introduction that Nick and I had chatted, um, my subject matter expertise in pharmaceutical sciences is in drug product formulation of poorly water soluble drugs. So this skill set is very useful in the cannabis industry because uh, cannabinoids and other plant based material are notoriously, notoriously insoluble um, to formulate. So using that skill set, uh, we are able to differentiate our products at Via Innovations by applying this fit for purpose a design strategy, having a lot more toolboxes than your standard uh, water solubilization approaches that are available on the market. As you said, um, I have a pretty extensive inhalation background uh, encompassing pharma, nicotine, and cannabis. Uh, to my excitement as well as horror, I discovered that my first product that I worked on, the Exubra, um, inhalable insulin <laughs> was found in the London Science Museum in 2006 when I was just perusing. So I um, definitely feel about dated, but def on also knowing that the work that I was doing has is having an impact. And, and over to the right, that's where I met Dr. Dan Miller, who is has been my lifelong scientific advisor now via innovations um, active uh, sci well, scientific mentor, now at Viet Innovations Active Scientific Advisor. And we met working on, um, at Nectar Therapeutics on this on inhalable products. Um, Nectar was then bought out by Novartis where Dan Miller stayed and he led the uh, formulation of the inhalable products division. So we have a very strong uh, background on inhalable uh, formulations at Viet Innovations. 
But I would say the core of what I do, regardless of science, everything that, that kind of keeps me going is my practice with yoga. And a lot of people, a lot more science-minded, have trouble understanding that I, I have such a deep integrated love and appreciation and uh, practice for yoga. So it seems to be a little bit of a um, disparity between the mind body component and the pure physical component. So my objective with this talk is really to integrate the, uh, the three um, passions in my life and well as expand over to, okay, so if you're not a yoga practitioner, you're not interested in yoga, maybe there's some tools that you could learn to improve your uh, sport that you're doing. So um, examples that, I, that I've that i done, as you can see with Dan Miller, this was our um, half marathons. So I ran a number of half marathons and I've done a number of different sports throughout my life, but yoga has always been the core basis of that. Um, my personal practice and lineage uh, is called the Rocket Ashtanga Base. It's, it's quite um, physically intense. It's perfect for those A-type personalities. Um, if you think yoga is very boring I, I, or, or more laying around in, in meditation, I encourage you to check out an Ashtanga Rocket class. Um, it's a, it was origins in San Francisco, and so the founder, Larry Schultz, he actually taught the uh, Grateful Dead early in the days. And so cannabis and this yoga lineage were, were often um, integrated. And I was, I was very surprised because it wasn't until I started practicing the rocket that I integrated cannabis. My assumption is it would make me lazy and it would hinder that practice. And actually I have discovered um, that it actually does the, the opposite. So that's a little bit of a part of my goal in, in sharing this presentation with you today. So for the non-cannabis uh, scientists, non-cannabis consumers in the audience, I really wanted to start off with this image to demonstrate how complex and diverse this plant is. Um, coming from pharma, highly regulated, we're often working with a single molecule active pharmaceutical ingredient. So that would be more resemblant of this isolated compound here. But in cannabis, we have all of these different extraction methods, which then yield different uh, cannabinoid types. So that would be like THC or CBD, different concentrations. So if we go back to this isolate, it's around 99%. Um, say this crude oil could be as low as 55% of that target THC cannabinoid. Um, what else makes the difference are other plant-based materials, terpenes, terpenoids, flavonoids, fatty acids, all of these compounds uh, work harmoniously. And actually we call this the entourage effect where they enhance um, the efficacy of that extract. Where we're, as scientists, um, we are trying to isolate and understand the, the individual as well as combined components. And given all of these different um, plant material active forms, makes it a very uh, complex process. Um, also coming from the pharma industry, when you start off early drug development, you have, they say 10,000 potential compounds when you first get started and then they get um, reduced down to your final, perhaps you even make it to a marketed product. And these compounds get eliminated for a number of reasons from the pipeline. Uh, cannabinoids would definitely get eliminated just because their physical chemical properties are so hard to work with. So that was something I vastly underestimated um, when I got into the industry, as well as um, the adaptation to all natural ingredients. All my uh, formulation background in pharma, these are synthetic. So understanding and appreciating um, that was was important. And, and that was also very much tied into my uh, yoga training where I was introduced to Ayurvedic medicine for the first time. And then again, um, expanding on the experience with uh, e-cigarettes, working with uncertain changing regulatory um, environments. Oftentimes, <laughs> sometimes it's happened where we, at V Innovations, we start formulating a product and then the regulations change and we have to pivot. So there's a little bit of um, chicken and egg and, and catch up and a little bit of uh, game to play there. And um, so for this talk, like, like I said, this is something completely different than I normally speak about. So I'm really excited. Um, where I focus on the integration of various scientific disciplines. And so my objectives for this journal club was to really uh, understand the athletic performance and recovery needs, 
from a scientific component, combine the mental focus with physical uh, performance. And then as a product formulator, um, investigate what type of products can best support athletes and also mention and highlight where areas that could also hinder them and uh, focusing on these three um, main factors around route of administration, what type of product, and, and of course the, the dosing. Now for this, I tapped into a journalistic um, hat, I'd say, and, and did a little bit of research so I could really understand um, a wide variety of athletes and, and their considerations and, and needs. Um, phoned a lot of friends and, and, made, a, and made a new friend with uh, Jonathan Lasano along the way. Uh, so worry they agrees wellness. Um, focusing on the medicinal components of CBD and its influence on athletes. Uh, this was founded by a group of scientists. So um, great for social media. We had posted this and, and, and Johnny Lasano had reached out. So that was a really great um, recommendation there. The rest of the folks on the list are uh, friends and, and family. And I selected these, not uh, these individuals not only because they are uh, subject matter experts and and extreme science, uh, but, sorry, extreme athletes. Uh, they also have a strong background in science, in science, or at least the or the um, the interaction of substances in correlation with their uh, practice. So starting off with what I know the best, which is yoga. Um, in, in yoga, we, you may have heard there's the eight limbs of yoga, um, and this is a practice that we do that leads towards the next, which is finally the ultimate goal of the union, the harmonization of mind-body effect. Uh, when you go into a yoga class, most likely we'll be focusing on the yoga postures, and that's usually what people think, some on the breath control, but really what I want to focus on is where that breath ties in from an external um, component of the practice and then transitions more to an internal where then you go into that uh, sensory withdrawal concentration meditation. I mentioned that the rocket practice is a type personality. Well, it involves a lot of handstands, arm balances. Um, you take a rocket three course or class, it's, it's 90 minutes, 90 postures up to like uh, just it, it's it's intense and so the way you are able to sustain such a uh, practice is through the breath um, and really focusing and transitioning more on the moment rather than uh, how bad your your bad your body is hurting at the time now through the uh, interviews that I had again reconnected I had chatted with uh, Dr. Tim Challens, who is a fifth degree black belt in Cook Sewell, it's a Korean martial arts. Um, he also has a PhD in philosophy. So I thought he would be ideal to talk about this mind-body um, integration. And so one of the things that stood out from our, our conversation um, was his experience in watching these um, martial artists increase, enhance their strength and going into um, some martial arts being more external versus more internal focused. And so that's where I saw that, that connection with yoga as well. But if you were to focus solely on um, the external forces, then you may be able to uh, enhance your, or maximize your strength maybe twice as much. However, if you combine the external this versus and the internal um, practices together over time, he's seen, um, individuals enhancers maximize their strength up to seven times what would normally be expected. So this is again another really clear um, example of, of the mind-body connection and where it can um, really fuel your practice uh, regardless of what uh, sport that you're into. So we're mentioning breath. Now I'm going to talk about the Ujjayi breath because that's what we use um, in Ashtanga and rocket, and, and that's also called victorious and, and ocean breath. It It's different in standard, it's what we call belly breathing. We actually uh, use the diaphragm um, to expand and contract our lungs. And the way, and the reason we do that is 
uh, when you think about these twisting postures, um, it keeps the belly engaged and it gives yourself a little bit more room. So there's a there's an inhalation and you're really lengthening the spine and opening up the chest cavity to really draw in all of that oxygen. In addition to that, it's called ocean breath because we do make a sound. We close the, the back of the throat and it does sound like, like an ocean. So there, it has a few uh, purposes for that. By closing the throat, we're warming the body faster from the inside out and the sound uh, becomes meditative and rhythmic. So if your like, muscles are aching and dying, you're trying to hold this posture. If you hone in on, on the breath and, and the sound, it, 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 it um, enhances the parasymp parasympathetic nervous system, that fight or flight component, and it keeps you relaxed. And so this is uh, one of an example of the tools that we use in yoga, but there's so there are many other uh, breathing practices and a lot of literature is out there how uh, yoga breathing as exercises will improve uh, your performance in other sports. Now, walking away from just the breath and moving more into the mental component, um, this picture here. Um, is of uh, Dr. Tom DeBrun. He, he, this is him winning the um, Ironman Cozumel first place back in 2019, I believe. Um, so it's quite uh, recent. And so in my discussions with Tom, I, what I thought was very interesting to point out in this talk is that towards the la last leg of his race, which is, which is running, um, yeah, I imagine he's very fatigued. And what kept him going was a tool that he met, that he read at Magical Running by Bobby McGee, where uh, they he um, created a, a saying and just repeated that over and over and over. And he did that throughout his practice for the training. And he said, you sound like a crazy person, but you're yelling and you're running. And 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 to me, that is a perfect translation of how. Um, that mantra that or that we say in yoga or that repetitive thinking that really transitions your brain away from the pain and more onto the breath and the rhythm of, of what you're you're working with. All right, so moving a little bit more back onto the physical and uh, less mental component of, of physical activity. And so this is some of the data that Johnny Lasano has shared with me from Six Degrees Wellness, uh, where they looked at 101 uh, subjects across 21 states and evaluated their use of cannabis before, during, and after physical activity. So you can see there are, it varies depending on where you are um, in your practice, which is to be expected, but there's still a lot of a, beyond the pain management and relief, um, there's a lot of mental component in here. So while we still haven't done sufficient studies, um, more clinically controlled, randomized trials on this, the, there is data out there to, to demonstrate and point to that, yeah, guess what? It does actually help you with, with finding that um, focus and faster recovery. So let's talk about how cannabinoids actually interact with the body. So um, some of you may or may not know that we actually produce cannabinoids um, endogenously. So uh, two of these are anandamide and 2-AG. And then they were bind to our endocannabinoid system, the CB1 and CB2 receptors. CB1 are primarily in the central nervous system, CB2 um, being more in the um, immune. So while we produce endocannabinoids in our body, we can also get uh, cannabinoids from um, the plant. So the cannabis plant being one. Um, and these are produced in resinous glands called trichomes. And if you look here to the figure um, down on the left, we have CBGA. Um, I call that the granddaddy cannabinoid to which all the other cannabinoids are then expressed. Um, selecting here the pathways for CBD, uh, which is the more next to THC is one of the more common cannabinoids. Um, but if we look here, um, there's some CBG and CBDA also have some interesting properties too. So it's a matter of us cannabis scientists working on um, improving the extraction efficiency, isolating these compounds, understanding them and running more studies, but there's continuously more work going along the way. And so while we know that say CBG has some anti-inflammatories, we know CBD, it's really fine tuning and, and 
and really honing in on the, the true mechanism of action and, and that will just come with, with more time. What you may or may not know is that cannabinoids are also produced in other plants. Um, more recently, I found that CBG is prevalent in hydroponically grown tomatoes. Um, so there's other areas in nature that we can find cannabinoids and, and cannabinoids are uh, being synthesized um, in other means outside of the cannabis plant. And endo, our endocannabinoid system, so I mentioned um, anandamide, that actually influences our runner's high. Um, anandamide is, is known as a bliss molecule. Um, going back to the yoga, it's a Sanskrit word um, for, for bliss. Uh, we find anandamide in chocolate and it's, it's triggered by the dopamine um, activation of the dopamine receptors. It controls our pain, um, sensory experiences and our overall euphoric feelings. So, um, highly encouraged for the athlete and runner's high exercise. You'll find a lot of data on that that you may not be aware of. And I also wanted to point out here around dosing and a preview of more stuff to come. Um, it's very challenging to dose uh, cannabinoids. And if, if we look the example here, uh, nandamide, I mentioned it, it influences that runner's high. That feels great. I, I miss it. Um, I haven't run in a while for a number of reasons, um, primarily injury and uh, entrepreneurialism. Um, but then you can take it too far. And, and many of those runners know when you hit that wall. Um, similarly, if you look at THC, it, low doses, you know, and it causes anti-anxiety. Um, but you take too much, you will be, uh, you can cause paranoia, couch lock, um, and if not, if not watch out for, for certain individuals, it could also induce a, a panic attack, for example. And it, it is really strange to have such differing um, pharmacological effects from the same molecule. So I just want to more, more of that to come, but setting the preference for, for how hard it is uh, to, to work with cannabinoids and, and predict their dosing. Now, additional uh, data from the Six Degrees Wellness uh, paper from Johnny Lasano's uh, studies looked here and and saw that primarily uh, inhalation is is the largest route of administration, and this was a 2019 study, so it's quite recent. Um, look, I'm breaking it down here individually as you see what type of inhalation products they're taking, but I'm what we'll, we are seeing is that the industry is moving away from that, and especially for athletes um, where their lung health is so critical to the performance. Uh, part of, an, in a separate discussion with uh, Adrian McCabot, so the yoga teacher talking about, um, you know, stigma and approach, uh, considerations of cannabis, um, also said this terms like shatter and these blow torches, it, it kind of drives, it, it turns them off. So and to the cannabis scientists out there, cannabis community, um, let's, let's keep pushing and look for other ways to make these products a little bit more safe and uh, recognizable to the wider market. So the lungs are very important. They're, they're massively important, yet as a lot of people in cannabis um, take them for granted. And so just wanted to start off by giving you a few lung stats. So you take the, both lungs, you could stretch them out to a tennis court. So there's a lot of surface area available for absorption. Um, actually 1500 miles of a uh, pathway for <laughs> airways. And I just did a look, that's from LA to Minneapolis. So that again, a lot of um, areas to, to take up whether compounds you want and you don't want. Um, for those who you don't want in your body, um, these are eliminated and they report up to around 70% of, of the elimination in your body. Um, putting my formulation hat back on, uh, we look at the aerodynamic particle size and that distribution and how that influences the bioavailability. Looking over to the right, um, you see the different size cutoffs of where you're trying um, to target or where your um, the lung deposition will occur. So looking um, at the pharmaceutical drug product development experience, we aim at a particle size between one and five uh, microns uh, diameter. And so that's really hitting the deep alveoli of the lung. 
tons of device formulation, testing, compatibility considerations. Uh, these are not separate um, components. They have to be developed and designed simultaneously, making um, inhalation product development very challenging. Also, from the pharmaceutical standpoint, there's not many excipients or inactive ingredients that we can even work with. There are no approved inhalation excipients in pharma. There are excipients that are found in inhalation products, but every time you go through it, there's a lot of reevaluation of exposure and, and dosing because the lungs are just so sensitive. Um, some of an additional considerations with, um, you see this image on the right, this is um, an in vitro testing to look at where the throat deposition lungs. So this is kind of understanding how the particle will travel down um, and the inertia will hit down to the deeper um, components of the lungs. And I just wanted to point out here is that for adolescents versus adults, there's a different design. And so, um, I'm 5'1", a buck oh five. I think Nigam's like almost six foot and I, I don't know how much you, you weigh, but my point is, is that we have different um, physiologies. And so uh, that's another consideration when you are uh, experimenting with, with any product, but definitely inhalation products too. Um, so vape pens, stopping at, before I kind of jump into that, just, you know, giving my background and my experiences having looked underneath the hood of many nicotine cannabis companies i have a strong opinion about vape pens and that there's just a lot of additional safety data necessary i personally will not touch a cannabis vape pen um, and i would actually i i don't consume nicotine um, but if i had to make my choice i would rather select a nicotine containing vape pen sold in the united kingdom than a cannabis containing vape pen um, sold in the, in the US. And so these are some of the reasons why. Uh, so let's start with formulations. Uh, unknowns increase as cannabis extract purity decreases. Okay, so in the cannabis industry, there is this drive and desire to have full spectrum. And so that means you have uh, more variety of cannabinoids, terpenoids, fatty acids, so that you have less of a pure um, compound. But we don't analyze 100% of the extract. Most of the time, um, when we're looking at C of A's in the cannabis industry, um, manufacturers, uh, dispensary sellers will look for uh, what's the target cannabinoid concentration. And, some, and if you're working with, say, 65%, cannabinoid purity, there's a lot of other materials that we don't know that are that are going into our lungs. Um, MCT oil is a popular one um, to uh, as a diluent um, in vape pens. These are not safe to inhale. Um, I've been saying this since I entered the industry um, and I will continue saying this. There's, there's other scientists that will, a Rolodex of scientists that will agree with me. Um, on this. Now, MCT is safe to orally ingest, put it on your skin, go for it. Do not inhale it, please. And the reason people are, or manufacturers will select it because they consider it all natural, um, therefore safe, but that, that's definitely not the case. Um, also, uh, terpenes are added to the cannabis extract um, for effects, flavor, to reduce the viscosity so it works better in the hardware. Um, but these are extremely high. We're seeing, um, I mean, 10% is average. I've seen as high as 30%. Um, I noted uh, Portland State University down here. So Dr. Strungen's lab, they're looking into um, these, this research exactly. Um, and, and there's a few, I think Dr. Strung and, well, he did speak about um, one or two journal clubs back. So I encourage you to look at, at his data. Um, but the point is, is that there's volatile organic compounds that are forming um, things you definitely don't want to inhale. Um, when the vape crisis came out, although I don't like that word crisis, because if you consider how many people died from vaping versus opioids or alcohol. I, yeah, so, but there was, there was definitely a um, wake up call for, for vaping um, that occurred. And, and I saw a lot of manufacturers saying, we don't use diluents, we only use all natural, we only use plant derived materials. And, and I, what I don't, uh, what I know that people don't realize is that 
uh, when they purchase these terpene blends, um, they're often stabilized with vitamin E. An example, say myrcene um, is extremely prone to oxidation. So they'll use vitamin E as an antioxidant. And again, we don't wanna be inhaling any of this stuff. If we go over to the hardware, um, regardless if it's e-cigarettes or cannabis, it primarily comes from Shenzhen, China. Um, and, and, and knowing from my experience in, in, in trying to set up these regulations, it's very hard to control the supply chain and ensure that you're getting a consistent material with, um, yeah, overall consistent um, product as you continuously order. Uh, I work with closely with the, the Blink Group and their CEO, uh, Arno Dumont Sirali. He is the ISO chairman for vaping uh, standards. So we met in the e-cigarette world uh, back in 2014. And he goes and audits these, um, these facilities and there's over 600 and, um, of manufacturers and less than 10% are actually ISO certified. So there's a lot more um, improvement that needs to be made. Um, and now if you look at a finished product, the formulation and hardware considerations, um, extractables and leachables aren't being tested, uh, emissions are not yet evaluated, and um, like I mentioned, there's a limited amount of formulation um, compatibility um, assessed. Another thing I want to highlight here is the addition of heat. So if we have all of these other compounds and we heat them, that in enhances, increases chemical reactions. So a great um, example of this is uh, you can take THCA, so the acidic form of THC, apply heat, it gets decarboxylated um, into THC. Now THC is, an, is not psychotropic um, and THC very much is. So this is a clear um, illustration how just the implementation of heat will change the effect and the performance. And now this is just one compound. Um, these vape pens can have numerous compounds in them. So I would say, what do I do yet? Because yeah, I agree. I admit to, I, um, I, per, I enjoy inhalation, um, but my recommendation, the safe, safest until these regulations um, and research goes is to select your classic flower, heat not burn, um, which is just below the combustion temperature. I always recommend uh, legal cannabis where you are uh, ensured that they're passing pesticide, pesticides and, and microbial testing because that, that will also lead to, um, if that's not washed, will lead to lung damage as well. All right, so showing some of the results of the um, SF Tri Club. So one of the first interviews I had was as an officer and he uh, at the SF San Francisco Tri Club. Um, and I chose the tri triathletes because, well, that I'm hitting three at the um, three sports at once, and I also know that they're very intense about their practice and their performance. So I was really curious to hone in on this specific um, target audience. And what we saw here, um, based on the results of 24 participants in a short survey, um, was in fact that uh, 29, nearly 30 percent, are primarily um, well, using topicals, non-cannabis related topicals to um, relieve their pain, anxiety, and improve their performance. Of those that did use cannabis, um, you can see that that trend um, applies where 25% are using topicals and transdermals. So I understand that this is a little bit um, conflicting of what the uh, previous data I showed from um, Six Degrees Wellness. Um, and my hypothesis is because they looked at the 21 states versus the San Francisco Tri Club, California. Um, those athletes have access to a wider variety of cannabis product types. And that is in um, correlation with, with the general cannabis industry market. And I just see those numbers um, increasing more and more. So cannabinoids do interact with the skin. Uh, there's a lot more research that we need to conduct and understand, um, but it is it is ongoing um, as the legal landscape opens up, more uh, skilled scientists uh, take the leap and enter uh, the cannabis market. So there's a ton, there's more and more data um, being uh, published in this realm too. So 
Um, just looking here at this one particular study, uh, you can see that um, the CB1 receptors are found on various skin cell types, as well as um, cannabinoids interacting with the TRP channels, um, which you know, can control everything from, um, say, hair growth um, to just general epidermal uh, homeostasis. And focusing here more on uh, topicals, um, it's very hard to get cannabinoids across the skin or actually any molecule across the skin. Um, the main barrier is the stratum corneum. So if you look here on the right, it resembles say a brick wall. Um, and the number of layers that you have on the stratum corneum um, <laughs> will dictate how difficult it is to actually get this compound through the skin. So um, part of the reason why my running career is done is a thing called plantar fasciitis. And I'm having um, trouble getting medicines absorbed in that very uh, bottom of the foot, very thick skin component. Uh, you go more to thinner skin, jaw angle, um, on a rabbit on your scrotum, it'll soak it right up. So. Again, you have to think about when using um, cannabis topicals to support your athletic performance, think about where you're applying it and whether um, a topical is the best approach. Uh, other considerations too is you may not want to get it all the way past the stratum corneum. You might want to have it more um, in, the mus um, in the muscle for more of a targeted drug of delivery. So think around um, what your effect is and in terms of what product type that you wanna use. And so as I mentioned, uh, cannabinoids are very hard to get across the skin. Um, most, unless you're formulating it to be transdermal, most likely it will not be transdermal. And, and it, it illustrated here. So um, what, a if you look at this log P scale, and so what log P uh, stands for is the octanol water partition coefficient. So it essentially says, does the compound prefer water or fat or blood or fat? And so that's a measurement that we look here. So cannabinoids do hit all of the ideal um, parameters or physical chemical properties for transdermal permeation with the exception of their log P. That is because they're such fatty, oily, um, compounds. Now keep in mind, this is a log scale. So um, if you're jumping from a log P of three all the way to the seven of CBG, you're over a thousand times um, th that ideal property. So again, it is very hard to get these compounds through the skin. Um, compounded by that is if we are working with a full spectrum um, extract. So that is the less purity of cannabinoids, other materials, you don't know what these own nuns are and, and you also need to try and get those through the skin. So there's, there, there's not, not one product is, is formulated alike. And again, it's the, that product specifically for your um, exact need. Now at the innovations, I, I like to consider myself a creative thinker and very lucky to partner with amazing humans. Um, these are one of our first um, clients that we worked with where we use the properties of the cannabinoids to our advantage in a topical formulation. So showing here um, the Shark Bands founders, um, they're surfers. They, uh, for those of you who don't know Shark Bands, it's a, well, it's a shark deterrent um, that uses uh, magnetic um, frequency to deter these sharks without uh, physically hurting them. So these guys grew up um, in the water and it was very important that they not only had an all natural sunscreen, that it was reef safe, plant-based, non-nanoparticle, titanium dioxide, zinc oxide. So from a formulation standpoint, they gave me a very small window um, to work with. So it's been, it's been a labor of love um, with this project, but we, we do have a lot of great um, exciting results to share. Um, so when we get started is that the, um, what was known is that cannabinoids are generated in the plant to protect itself from UV rays and other stresses. So the hypothesis is that it would do the same thing for our skin. And so that was in fact correct. And we uh, applied uh, for a patent early last year and expect that to be uh, granted later this year, if not early um, 2021. 
Right now, the CBD version is sold nationally at Urban Outfitters, and uh, we are fine tuning the THC CBD um, version that will come out in 2021, and as well as some other um, exciting developments with, with this brand and, and this approach to um, sunscreen and sun care. Um, and another thing to really note with this um, project is that uh, with the sunscreen, this was launched before uh, the wider um, companies or, or distributors started banning these chemical-based uh, sunscreens. So we, these guys were very much ahead of the, the curve. So I feel very uh, fortunate to have um, been along with this journey with them and, and many more things to come. All right, so if we move from topical to oral, if you remember oral um, in from the survey was was the least used and 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 through the discussions and interviews that's that's likely due to the poor prediction of these compounds. So um, this is where V innovation today is really honed in on is improving the solubility to enhance the oral bioavailability to create a more predictable, um, user experience. And so bioavailability is defined at the rate and extent to which a compound reaches the systemic circulation. So in your effect feeling. Um, it can take forever. It'll take two hours to hit. They have to go through the gut, um, broken down in the gut, dissolve, taken, a, a solubilized, taken up through the intestine where there's even um, some pre-systemic uh, metabolism occurring, entering the liver through the um, hepatic portal vein, where it gets metabolized extensively um, with this first pass metabolism, and then eventually um, into your blood. Uh, that's why, uh, for those of you who have tried both edibles as well as smoking, it feels very different. And that's due to, say, the 11-hydroxy-THC, which is also, um, act is also an active molecule. Um, but it is a different molecule that you are um, experiencing. So that's why um, some people might be more inclined to edibles versus not, it just through that effect. But in general, um, I've learned with the athletes, they, they wanna know what they're getting and they want it to be predictable. Uh, one thing that stood out is, is nothing new on race day. And so working with something that is um, hard to, um, yeah, predict how it will go is, is really shying away um, from the, the athletic consumer. And then we're looking into what WADA um, stance on, on cannabis and, and how that's evolved. So this was taken um, copy paste from the WADA website. And so it's showing that CBD is um, an exception to this. Um, but I'm hoping to see, and I do predict that uh, there'll be other cannabinoids that are also non-psychotropic such as CBG and CBC that will also have positive influence um, on, on the athletes as well in their performance and recovery. But there's also um, considerations and exceptions that you can evaluate. So there's a therapeutic uh, use exemption committee that will review on a case by case basis if an athlete is injured, if they, um, and, and then they need this cannabis to, um, for their health and well being. Um, one example, uh, that came to mind was say the with challenge athletes uh, foundation this is a really um a really really great organization um highly encourage you to look it up um donate but these these athletes are are they have various impairments and therefore um, increased pain. So this is an example where the committee will look and, and evaluate it. And they are um, widening up their regulatory stance. So they recognize that a lot of athletes were failing testing because there was residual THC um, in their system um, due to out of competition recreational use. So they, they have increased it um, slightly. So that's the question for the athlete might wonder, okay, well, when do I stop? Um, how long does it stay in my system? I mean, or if you're, you gotta go for a drug test. So there, there's a few things to consider here and, and the root administration is a really, really big one. Um, and that's because of the differences in half-life um, as, as a result of the root of administration. So that's the final time taken for the plasma concentration of the compound to be reduced in half. And so if you are somebody who is more prone to 
oral ingestibles, you can expect that to be um, circulating through your body much faster. Um, and then and then uh, smoking, it was interesting to see from this data um, as high as 31 hours and then so on and so forth. So this data was taken from a very extensive review that looked at clinical PK data um, in summarizing this. Um, and then over to the right, um, this was uh, provided by my dear friend, Dr. Linda Klumpers and her colleague, Dr. Michael Tagan, um, where they're looking at the THC metabolite formations and comparing smoking versus edibles. Again, honing in on the big difference of the first pass um, metabolism difference by um, route of administration. So you also have to think dose. Um, so when I spoke with Adrian, I really appreciated his open and honest conversation with me and, and allowing me to share this with you guys. Um, Adrian, um, prior to his um, career or his passion as, as a yoga teacher, I mean, he, he, he's on his hands more than anyone I know. Uh, game changer, if you wanna practice your handstand or nail that down, um, take Adrian's class. Um, but we talked about uh, substances. And uh, as I mentioned, I come from the rocket community, of Grateful Dead origin. So yeah, cannabis wasn't a like a big surprise, but I, I thought it was interesting to talk to Adrian, who um, is part of that community, but uh, doesn't necessarily consume how we do. And, and through the discussion, I did discover that he, um, every once in a while, will take a CBD vape pen. Um, and feeling that, well, what after about five years, he felt that it was it was okay, um, and it didn't push him over into any other substances. So it's more like the relationship that you have with um, cannabis and why you use it, just like any other substance. If you you know have a drink, a glass of wine to relax, or you to or forget your day and and, and black out. So it's um, and all of these things also still apply with with cannabis. So. One interesting finding um, through my discussions with, again, do, uh, Dr. Johnny Lasano and the Six Degree Wellness, so they looked at um, 24 uh, physically active males, both uh, cannabis consumers and non, and they looked at a, a variety of uh, um, functions and performance. And we did see that um, there was some a fatigue with the cannabis consumers. It was, there was more of a trend, um, not necessarily statistically significant, um, but there is something there that, that is worth investigating. Um, another finding that they had was an elevated um, C-reactive protein concentrations in these chronic users, which places them at a higher um, cardiovascular risk. So again, um, cannabis is safe. Um, we produce endocannabinoids in our system, but it's stepping back and understanding why I'm using cannabis, how much I'm using cannabis, and, and the method of, of consumption is, um, is I want the audience to take away. And finally, I'll end up with the conclusions and recommendations. Uh, your endocannabinoid system is unique to you. Uh, try <laughs> what works for me will not work for uh, Nigam. Um, and then that doses. So the, the key is to start low and go slow. Um, there's so much variety in this plant. There's so much variety in cannabis products coming out on the market. Um, you will find something that will tailor and complement your life. Um, athletes are transitioning away from inhalation, very much um, similar to the wider market. Um, just be careful with vape products. Again, watch how often you consume, where you consume, ask, ask questions because um, it, it, you don't want to mess with your lungs. Uh, topicals. Yeah. So consider the topical effects. Do you have a general chronic pain? Um, then we would recommend a transdermal patch, for example, we have a low concentration going through the body. If you have more of a muscle ache, then look for a, a relief balm, for example. Um, it's very hard to get high off of topicals. Um, Dermals are, are mostly on the market. So unless you're seeing transdermal drug delivery, um, chances are you won't get high. Um, or, or, and especially if you're working, if you're working um, and incorporating say CBD, um, that definitely won't, won't be the case. 
Um, with edibles, uh, yeah, it's uh, look for fast acting or water soluble technologies. They're seeing more and more um, coming out on the market. So this will give you a more consistent user experience. Again, if you want to incorporate that in your practice, use it for a while. And I would say use a few um, batches or bottles or what um, supplies from that same vendor to make sure that you are in fact um, receiving a consistent experience. Um, definitely route of administration is important around health and um, efficacy um, of what you're trying to achieve. Uh, there's an entourage effect between um, breath, body, mind. Uh, there's there's a lot more you can ever come when, when you put your, your mind to it without, <laughs> yes, that sounds cheesy, but um, it, I've noticed it very much with the case in my yoga practice and it's it what keeps it's what really what keeps me um, sane and able to uh, achieve and and run and work the hours that that I do at, at V Innovations and and then also there's there's just so much so much more research and work necessary um, in the cannabis space as more scientists come on board um, we are pushing that that um, education and. Um, sophistication and efficacy and safety further, but we need your feedback. And and I'm and that was part of my goal here is to really bridge the non-cannabis consumers, um, athletes with the cannabis scientists, so we can um, help us help you. Uh, and then finally, I want to acknowledge who. A survey, all of my friends, and also uh, Dr. Johnny Lasano. Thank you so much for for reaching out. It added tons of value and information to um, this talk uh, via Innovations. My team, where we are, um, yeah, I love my team. We're awesome, <laughs> and we're we're mainly uh, scientists. So uh, we work with other collaborators. Um, scientific and non-science alike. I'll, I'll jump to the non-science first, so 399 groups. So they're they're the newest um, within our family wheelhouse um, to help with the business development and sort of mentorship. And um, But huge, huge thanks to Linda Klumper's Verdient Science, uh, Dr. Marcus Rogan too. Uh, the three of us work together quite closely um, and, and just having their friendship and, and communication uh, over the, the years has been very, um, is very valuable. Um, Joanna Newding uh, on Casually Baked. I go into a lot more um, details. This is a podcast. So there's specific podcasts on vaping, on topicals, on cannabis and yoga, um, if you want to go a little bit further. And of course, with CAN. And then finally, the um, some of the references and the organizations that I um, spoke about in the stock. And for the rest, that is it. Thank you so much for your time. Well, thank you for your excellent presentation, Monica. We um, are close on time, but we do have some questions from the audience. So I'd like to um, just uh, toss a couple of these your way. So our colleague at CAN, uh, Amber Wise, has a question for us. So Amber is asking, is there definitive knowledge or research regarding transdermal migration of THC or THCA in regards to failing drug tests. There are anecdotal rumors that people who use CBD orally or topically can fail drug tests. So folks in jobs that can be randomly tested are generally reluctant to try it, even if it's only CBD. So from your experience or from your surveys with, with athletes, um, do, do you have any thoughts on this, Monica? Yeah, I will go back. Um, I think, Again, it's very hard to get cannabinoids through the skin. So yeah, we're, let me go back to this, the, the metabolite formation. I might have been gone back to that. Anyways, um, the, the CBD molecule um, does not have a pharmaceutically active metabolite, not that we're aware of. Um, so that is that risk is quite low. With THC, yes, you do run that risk of... Um, having residual, yeah, the metabolite converted and absorbed into your bloodstream. Um, absolutely. But again, they have to look for transdermal products specifically. Um, I have done a number, I've done research or uh, literature searches on 
um, on this exact thing, and I haven't I haven't seen any reports of it uh, failing drug tests. But if you're going out for a job that you really want, I would say don't take the risk. <laughs> I think that's uh, I think that's good advice. Um, you know, we, we know a lot of folks out there um, le- like their cannabis products, but you know, some things like a big job or, or whatever are, are simply worth the wait, given the kind of strange time we live in with regulations related to THC and such. So, uh, one other question for you, Monica: um, You had shown early on some of these different types of uh, concentrates and such. Um, uh, and one of our uh, attendees is, is asking about, uh, or mentioning that these can be confusing in academic research or to people who are unfamiliar. Um, so do you have, uh, recommendations or thoughts, uh, so far as terminology when we are kind of discussing these things with folks who are interested in cannabis, but aren't, you know, insiders in the industry or users necessarily? <laughs> yeah. Like I was saying, um, I remember Adrian saying, he's like, why, why do you guys use terms like shatter? <laughs> uh, which is what I put it. Yeah, I agree. It is really um, confusing. And, and that's why I started off with this because that was such a, uh, a, obvious clear thing in my in my face when I, when I transitioned from pharma um there there are a few there are some extracts that are more common than others being the isolate distillate crude oil rosin so um some are used more than others uh, there is there are other areas that are doing a lot of education around extraction on there but the the truth is is there is still a lot of um, unknowns and a lot of miseducation out there. And so for academics, yes, I completely understand where you're coming from. Um, That's why oftentimes the isolated molecule is used for development. So they just first get an understanding of the cannabis, um, of the cannabinoid compound, and then you can build up on the complexity from there. Definitely. Um, Well, we are a few minutes over time. So Monica, we will thank you again for joining us at Can Journal Club and for your presentation. Uh, Thank you again to our sponsors and to all our attendees. And we will see everyone uh, next month for the uh, final talk of the year. Thank you for having me.